getting you warmed up. Thank you. Oh man, let me let me just do this real quick. I don't know what I'm doing here. Hold on. Let's see if I can. You good? Still doing okay? You guys healthy? Everybody feeling healthy? Plague? Anybody got the plague? No, no plague? That's plague free out there? Phew. Nice, nice. Once upon a time, there was a magical, beautiful festival planned. <laughs> That's the only story I can think of. Listen, man, <laughs> I can't say this, but when we, when we named those festivals, you know, I gotta say, like, Mike, we always ask Mike to make lists. He's so good at it. He's so good at it. He makes these, he comes to band practice with these crazy lists of names. So, you know, The Great Went and Lemon Wheel, those were all on Mike's lists. And... I must say that, for the record, that was the first festival that the four of us didn't name. <laughs> Curveball? Mm. That's my theory. You heard it here first. And Mike did have a list, including such winners as Rock Donkey Dunkle. Or <laughs> one that I contributed to the list, which was exactly as planned ball. <laughs> Mike also contributed <laughs> one of my all time favorites. This is a, not a G rated name. If there's any children in here, ear, earplugs. Mike thought we should call it um, the Big Cocksuck and Dupe Fest. <laughs> We figured that no teenage boy on the entire Eastern Seaboard would miss that concert. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Horrible. What else was on there? So many good ones. I actually thought... <laughs> oh, God. No, no. I actually thought a good one would have been a mom ball, and the idea would be that Everyone who bought a ticket, right, we would, you know, trace their credit card and stuff and figure out who their mom was <laughs> and secretly invite their mom so that when the entire, everyone showed up, they would be greeted by all the moms, like 35,000 moms, like, hi, I'm, I'm going to be here the whole weekend with you. <laughs> that would have been good, right? Like, oh, Mom, I love that you're here. The whole weekend? <laughs> wow, okay. But no, but no. We called it Curveball. And that's the end of that. <laughs> Listen, man. Uh, last thing, last thing on this subject. Last thing on this subject. Our festival, 
was so much cooler than the other festival that didn't happen there in the last two years. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> so there. We win the canceled festival contest. La last thing, I'm gonna play, I really wanna play now. I'm excited to play, it's been a while, but here's one of the things, this is a, I am telling you God's honest truth, one of the things that you didn't get to see at, at Curveball was that we had, oh, God kills me. We had, uh, we had, we had this thing where it was all laid out beautifully, like where the stage was and everything. And we came up with this fun idea that there are two ways to get to the stage from the campground, right? One way was the long way around, which was a beautiful, smooth path and nice for walking and everything to the stage if you forgot something in your tent. The other way was much shorter, but in order to get from the stage to your tent, you had to go through a mime field. <laughs> so. Dude, I am not making this up. I am not making this up. So like, you're like, oh shit, I forgot my whatever in my tent. Oh, the this, this set's about to start, right? Oh shit, damn it, I gotta go through the minefield. <laughs> you're walking through the minefield, and you're like, step on something, and a mime pops up like. Because <laughs> like, everybody hates mimes, right? And they're like blocking your way. You know what I mean? They're like, whatever, you know? And you're like, okay, okay. I gotta. Like the first day would be really funny, but it would be so horrible. So we hired 50 mimes. I kid you not. And this is the best part of it. So they were there. Okay on site when it got canceled. And I'm like saying, I left, Fishman uh, stayed, and ended up just getting plastered with all these mimes <laughs> the night that Curveball got canceled. And he kept sending me these pictures, and like the mimes were like, <laughs> sad mimes. It was like sad, unemployed mimes. <laughs> like, <you know>, more. <laughs> That's what you missed at Curveball. All right, all right, all right, all right. Ah, what a what a loss. <laughs> There have been some tough things in the news lately, but none as tough as that, as the loss of the minefield. <laughs> I'd love to. Are we invited? Oh, let me, let me, let me play something now. Okay. All right, okay. Here we go, let me, let me think here. Oh, yeah. Oh, let me do this, let me do this. Cool, you guys okay with this? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, hello, hello. We're all here. I stole that little thing. Ooh. Ah. Um, Ella Fitzgerald used to say that, apparently, whenever she came on stage. She would say, we're all here, and I love that. Um, we're all here. Um, let me do this here. Hi, everybody. Hello. I hear you. Um, Thanks for having me back. We've been here a number of times, you know. <laughs> I think we're here and actually every time I come to Dayton is 94. Every time it's right after um, 
some big event in my life happens, I always come immediately to Dayton. <laughs> so like, I got married in 94 and then whoosh, see you later. Played here at the Nutter Center, right? Was it at the Nutter Center in 94? It wasn't. Thank you, thank you. Fact check, fact check. It was at, uh, it was at the Hera Arena. Arena? <laughs> the Hera Stadium, which we used to play. Back. And then I had, a, then we had our first baby, and then like two months later, I was back at 95. We had a baby. That was when we played at the Nutter Center. And we did the chess move, right? Was that 95? No. Were you guys there or did you read about this? Because, like, you know, I think, um, I think you guys cheated. <laughs> anyway, um, there you go. Oh, next big event? Oh, yeah, had another baby. Boom, right back to 97, had another baby, right back to the better center. <laughs> so like, have a baby, run away, come here. Get married, run away, come here. I don't know what happened in 2017. She didn't tell me, whatever the hell it was. <laughs> All right, moving on here. Oh, let me do this, let me do this. Let me see. It's a weird thing in singing that song because I just think about whenever I come to this part of the country, we, you know, driving through here when we were young um, with, in the van, we had, we had a car that we used to drive around in this Plymouth Voyager with the back seat taken out and um, we would, two guys would sleep in the back and two guys would drive, um, the four of us. And um, it's just so exciting, you know, like seeing the country this is probably in the 80s that we started doing this. And it's, it's just as exciting today as it ever was. I, I just get so thrilled to go around and meet people and, and whatnot. And this is gonna sound a little different than the kind of stuff I normally talk about, but I was thinking about this this morning that I have a, a unique perspective um, because I spend so much time on the road. I probably spent about 150 days of the year on the road, and I've been doing this for like 36 years. So, I mean, I spent half my life traveling. And um, so, um, one of the things that I, that really mystifies me and confuses me <laughs> is that like everywhere I go, um, people are, exactly the same and, and super kind and, and cool and, and you know, I was really thinking about it when I was in the deep south a couple of tours ago and just nicest, coolest people down there and I kept thinking that, some, like in Alabama and stuff, the people are so similar to my friends in Vermont, you know, the same, you know, out, like love of the outdoors and, and, um, and then like I look at my weird phone and um, I see this, like, you know, conceived divide <laughs> that we're experiencing in this country. And um, I just don't experience that. And maybe, you know, I drive around and I meet people. <laughs> it's just, it seems very odd to me. And I've just been noticing it more lately. You, you know what I mean, though? Um, like, you know, the, the, you know the, the us and them concept that, that I see through this weird little screen I hold in my pocket is 100% different than what I actually experience when I'm face to face with people all over this unbelievable country. <laughs> so that makes me wonder, <laughs> maybe the phone is the problem. <laughs> You know what I mean? 
because reality is not the problem. Remember the Crackberry? That was like 10 years ago when we had a Crackberry. Remember Crack? No, come on. What? I'm like a, I'm like a, I'm like a news crackhead on my, on my phone now. Like I'm like, and I actually prefer the real crack. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I'm kidding. All right, I've gone off. I'm off the, I'm off the deep end now. <laughs> Just kidding. Come on, you guys. I believe all this crap I say up here. Oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> Once upon a greasy day, I had the opportunity to play Flank by Old Lesson Stew. <laughs> there ain't no cure for suicide. Oh, all right. All right, man. Ah. Good singing, good singing. Thanks, nice, I gotta test you out on this one real quick before we move on. Let's see how, let's see what you do. Nice. I should be paying you. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, thank you. Whoever sent this up with a nice note attached to it. Thank you guys so much for being here. Good singing, well done. Guy wrote me a nice note. Timmy J. Thank you, Timmy J. I'll try it. Let's see what I can do. I take requests. <laughs> any guys at uh, any guys at Alpine Valley this summer? Alpine. <laughs> Thank you. That's fun. Oh, man. Yeah. I got one for you. Was anybody at a? This is going to be a, this is going to be silence. Get ready for the pin dropping. The pin dropping. Was anybody there when we played the rave in 1982? Oh come on! I don't believe you. You weren't there. Liar! Liar! You weren't at the rave. <laughs> Ninety-two. I think that was ninety-two. Eighty-two. I'm losing track of time. Uh, that's what happens when you live that wild life, kitties. You lose track of time. Don't do it. How about this one? <laughs> were any of you, <laughs> were any of you at the um, the OJ show in 1994? <laughs> that I believe. Just, <laughs> I know it's a lot of people, but that guy over there, like, were you actually at that show? Just please, tell me the truth. I don't know if I believe you. <laughs> you guys know about the OJ show? Do you know about it? That's weird. I'm trying to look. Oh, it was, um, it was at the Eagles Ballroom in 19... Is that still here? 
1994. And when, for those of you who don't know about the OJ show, I'll give you a very quick um, rundown. As we were walking on stage, right? We were playing at the Eagles Ballroom in 1994. And as we were walking on stage, there was this crew member and he had this like tiny little TV. These guys sit like right back there. There's probably a guy right back there now. He's, you know, sitting up there with his feet up on the table, like eating, you know, donuts or something. And um, he had this little TV on. We're standing on the side of the stage waiting for the lights to come down. And there was this thing going on with this white Bronco that was going down the... <laughs> and... Uh, it's, it's not as funny, I guess, now, in, in retrospect. At the time, we didn't know what was going on, so... It's, it's, I didn't know... What, we just knew he was going down the road and there was all these cops chasing him. So... <laughs> I'll do this. So he came out on stage. Ah. Anyway, it seemed kind of funny at the time, till we found out the rest of the story. <laughs> we thought he was just speeding or something. <laughs> All right, new subject. <laughs> Did it? Did it really? I don't think so, man. I don't think it worked out at all. <laughs> uh, uh. Um, let me do this. Oh, I can't do that. Let me, let me. You guys are crazy. Man. Let me tell you, I'm going to do this song. You guys, this is a nice town. I'm serious. I got to stay here, you know, like it's so rare that I get to stay twice in one place in the space of, you know, any number of months. But so we stayed here, we, you know, we stay in town when we're, when we're at Alpine Valley, and then we're here again. But um, it's just lovely, man. I walked down, you know... Okay, hang on. Settle down, settle down. <laughs> it's okay. It's all gonna be... It's all gonna be okay. <laughs> no, that's... You know, walking around down by, the, down by the water, down by that museum down there. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful town. Um, that was a funny thing to... <laughs> a funny thing to... That definitely threw me for a sec there, that, that one comment in the middle of that one. Oh, oh, it's a big love fest, you know, but... And right in the middle of that, the guy says, <laughs> I'm talking about you, man. He's like, play Windora Buck. He's like, and I'm like, I started thinking about it, and all of a sudden, like, I couldn't play anymore. Because <laughs> I'm like, can you play that on the acoustic? That was going through my mind. Finger picking is weird, man. It's like, if you ever think about what's going on down there, you're doomed. You're doomed. It's kind of, <laughs> that's okay, man. That's cool. You don't have to apologize. It's funny. Come on. Lighten up. <laughs> Sorry. I'm no kidding, man. <laughs> no, you should be sorry. I'm fucking pissed. I'm pissed at you, man. I'm kidding. Okay. What am I doing here? Oh yeah. Um. Yeah. Let me see one more of these. Um.
that song. Um, it's the first time I ever played that song, maybe, in my life. But. I wrote that about my friend Chris uh, from those on the Goes to the Forest album. And. Uh, thanks, you guys. That's nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. So this, this album that I did, this first song, um, um, I'll tell you something about the, uh, this guy. He's a great guy. Um, but um, Chris, my friend Chris, who I wrote that album about, uh, we grew up together, you know, from, from very early age. And um, Chris was an um, a outdoors enthusiast. He was a fly fisherman and like a really good skier. And he was always taking me outside and hiking and stuff. He was also a hunter. And uh, he was an elk hunter, and every year he would go up in the Rocky Mountains and hunt elk. He only, um, um, most of the time he just walked around up there, he told me. I think he only he had one, he got one elk. It, which, by the way, is, a, so he got this elk um, this one year, and it was a really big deal to him. It was, it was a very spiritual event um, that he talked to me a lot about. He was way up in the mountains, you know, day after day after day. And so these elk, um, there was a Native American term for, called ghost of the forest, which is for elk, right? That, and Chris told me that when you're, when you're tracking elk, um, you'd be following a trail, and the trail would just seemingly just end, like as if the whole herd had suddenly leapt sideways. Subsequently, they're very difficult animals to... to um, hunt to track um, so um, so he got this elk one year and he, he you know dressed it the proper way and he's very um, taught me a lot about about loving the natural world anyway he he had this thing you know we would come over we would eat the elk and 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 he was very proud of this event it, it was a spiritual thing for him. So anyway, last year, um, after finishing this record, we were playing at Dick's, right? Before the plague and all that? <laughs> you guys okay with the plague? Anybody have the plague? Cool? Everybody cool? Good. I'm concerned about you all. I don't, know. don't get the plague. Anyway, let me go back to this. So I went to Utah to spend a couple days before the Dick's weekend. It's just kind of like, and I went to this place, Antelope Canyon. Have you guys heard about that? There's this beautiful, beautiful canyon. And it's right on the edge of Navajo Nation, which is like 27,000 square mile Navajo um, Nation. Um, and the guy who was the guide in Antelope Canyon was a Navajo guide. And we spent the day together walking through this canyon. It's right before Dick's. And he started telling me this, I'm sorry, this is a long story, but it's, uh, he started telling me um, about how in their culture, a boy would go, th th he had done it, and his uncles and fathers would go hunt for elk with a bow uh, when they turn a certain age, like 16 or something, and that when they, when they get this elk, it's like a spiritual passing of, you know, into manhood. or. And I was, my head was blowing up when he was telling me this because I just finished this record. And um, um, the cover of the record is, is see, um, is like supposed to be like the spirits of Chris and then sort of my point of view of this elk kind of out in the forest and that's what that blob is. So I'll play this song now and this is the first song on the record, <laughs> but I had, um, I had tried to write this from the point of view of the elk, right? So, so if you listen to it, it's, Chris had told me there was this moment where there was like an eye contact moment when he was out hunting. And um, so somehow when I went through this canyon and this guy started telling me all this stuff about the historical significance and the spiritual significance in his culture about, you know, elk. Um, it kind of messed with my head a little bit after having just done this album. So here's the song. Thank you, it's good to be back. Thank you. 
usually do this crazy tuning thing so early, but I want to do this too. And then I'll... Play the... What? Play what? Ronaldo? You want me to de dedicate a song to Ronaldo? <laughs> okay, this is dedicated to Ronaldo. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm going to play yet. But it's dedicated to him. Thanks for having me back, man. So happy to be here. You have no idea. I'm really, I don't really know what, how to express my gratitude for being back in this lovely, I mean, I could do this. <laughs> would that, would that express? <laughs> okay, I won't do that. <laughs> my best friend in New York, I'm gonna shout him out, his name's Sherman, and he is, um, lives in Brooklyn, and we see each other every day. And he is the biggest, he's a bigger Vikings fan than anyone in this state. Don't believe me? He comes to every single game from Brooklyn. And he called me this morning and he said, you're gonna do this goal chant? I'm like, no man, I'm gonna do this goal chant. <laughs> He's like, you gotta do it, man. You gotta do it. I'm like, I'm not doing it. Anyway, that was for him. That little mini pathetic skull chant that I just did. And by the way, his friend, I'm gonna shout this guy out. Oh, God. I'm sorry, I can't remember your actual name, but his good friend that he sits next to at the games is one of those um, purple pimp guys. You're in the audience, so. Identify yourself. He's out there right now. Thank you. Any friend of Sherm's is a friend of mine, man. Anyway, on we go. Back to music from football. Back to music. Thanks, thanks everybody. It's funny playing that song that ostensibly a basketball themed, but even though I don't really think of it that way. But it did remind me that we, we uh, in 1996, we got to sing, we got to sing the anthem at a Timberwolves game at Target Center, which was really cool. <laughs> For us, at least. Hopefully it was a good anthem and that they won the game and everything. I hope so. Was anybody there? Was anybody? It was a big deal for us. But the other thing about that night that was pretty fascinating and, and pretty mind-blowing was that we got, um, we, we sang the anthem at, at the Target Center um, for the Timberwolves game, and this is in 1996, and I think we were playing there. How, I don't know how they could, yeah, we were. So I guess there was a basketball game one night and then a, the, the gig the next night. But um, we got invited to a party at, um, Princess party at Paisley Park. I think it was after the game, and um, you know, like we went, and it was really cool thing to to experience. You know, um, he pl uh, his band played. He played. It, it was you know recording studio, and we went, and there was a bunch of other musicians there, and like some journalist types, and um, just a bunch of people. And then the band set up and played, you know, it was Prince and his whole band in um, Studio A, which is like a room probably not that much bigger than what this stage is. And it was like just incredible. I, I mean, you can imagine that band, or, you know, a space this big. And um, so, I mean, I think back of that, about that with a lot of um, gratitude and honor to have. Got to meet him and have that experience, you know? One little detail that I always remember is that, at least at the time, he was, he was um, very adamantly not, not drinking, and so he also wasn't serving. And he didn't serve, like, alcohol or anything. And in lieu of, of um, drinks, he had um, 
everybody got like a box of Captain Crunch. <laughs> I'm being completely serious. I thought that was so cool. So, <laughs> and there were a couple of journalists, I think he was releasing an album and there were some people, they're kind of grumbling journalists, like, ah, I can't even get a drink here. And it was like, well, you, Captain Crunch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, where am I? Pretty soon, yeah. What's this one? What was that? Death. The death of that song. <laughs> There's really not much to that song other than what I just heard. Oh, you guys. Thank you. Thank you for... All right. This one's kind of close to that. Oh, man. Thank you. You know, I'm just singing that song. I just very quickly remembering that, like, you know, that was written sort of that way on the acoustic guitar. Some of these songs, when they go back to the original form, they bring back all these memories. But that line in there was about my dog that used to travel with us. <laughs> yeah, Marley. My little weird, she was a great dog. But she, and I thought about it because like in the early 90s, we came here all the times, I think three times a year. So, um, I think we played at the Orpheum like three times in 1993. Is that still there? And I think we played at like, um, the Caboose, you guys see? <laughs> like 1991 or something like that. And then First Avenue, we used to play all the time. And we used to drive here, you know, like in a car, you know. So we had a, we had a car and the four of us would drive here. And, and um, that one line in the Silent in the Morning was about, it's about you know, laugh and brush you often. I agree. So I was... Laugh and brush you often. It brings me oh, it brings a tear to my eye, my dog. But anyway, so uh, hopefully you guys will, you know, invite me back, man. I'm just sitting around like... Thank you. Sitting around waiting for an invitation, you know? Yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Let me do this. Let me do this. Come back tomorrow. Limb by limb. Oh, sleep. Okay, hang on. Hold on. Too fast. Ah. I want to do all those songs. I heard this, so I'll do this. Let's see if I can do this. You guys, yeah, thank you. I want to try this if you'll... No one's in a rush to get the hell out of here. Indulge me, maybe. I'm gonna play this song for um, for my wife Sue, who is not here, but from afar. We just passed um, 30 years since our first date. <laughs> Does that make me old? She's not, but what is it? Anyway, uh, I, I wrote this song. I figured 30 years is enough to justify the sentiment of this song. After 30 years, like, okay, I can say. Let's see here, this works. Oh, God, I just thought it was horrible. It says, the four of us have been joking around about our next album title. I guess I could give it away. We're thinking about... It'd be like um, 
dressed as like the string quartet on the, on the deck of the Titanic, you know, like, because you know how they kept playing? And then it would be called <laughs> On Deck to Die. <laughs> so, because, you know, we figure like every day, we do, it's not funny, but it's kind of funny. It's funny to us. Like, it's like, sorry, I mean, all these great musicians. And, we're like, damn, they're not that much older than us. Like every day there's another one. We're like, on deck to die. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's funny to us. Come on. That's <laughs> like, you know, the sequel to Big Boat. <laughs> I'm not trying to be, you know, insensitive to, but you know, like, for the record, when I, when I do die, you're free to make as many jokes as you want. It doesn't bother me, it won't bother me, you know what I mean? Like, like, you know. <laughs> I don't know, once you're up around 36 years, like, how long is it? This is so depressing. <laughs> My God. Come on, man. What the hell? Where are you, where are you going with this? Don't worry, we always have like a series, of, we always have a series of band rules, you know, like there's been one after another, like no analyzing was a big rule. And, and there was one that was, I am not scared of Paul <laughs> Languedoc, who was our sound man, he was kind of intense guy. We love him, I love him. Um, but the, one of them is we have, to, we have to play at least one good jam in our 90s, so. You guys are, we're, That's been a lot, it's an old rule. Um, you know, by the way, I need to thank the spirit of this lovely city for um, the, um, the, lot, the, the version of Slave to the Traffic Light from a live one was recorded here. Um, I think it was at like, I think it was at the Orpheum probably or something or one of these. I don't really know, but I know it was recorded here. So thank you for that because I like that version. Okay, on we go, on we go. We still here? Yes. Let me do like a couple more quick ones here. Oh man. Let me, let me try this. <laughs> Can I just indulge me one more time here? Let me, try, let me try this tune. Listen, I didn't practice this. Let me try this. Let's see what happens. You, you guys, thank you for your patience. That was weird. My brain is... I was just like sitting there thinking, and then I started thinking like, oh man, a couple things. First I started thinking about this weird dream I had last night, and then... I'm not gonna, I hate it when people tell me about their dreams. It's like, ah, uh, I gotta listen to a stupid dream. So I, I'm not gonna tell you about my dream. I'll tell you really quickly about my dream, but I'll just get off it quickly. I was at this, um, oh my God. I was at this. Somehow I was like hanging out with Ezra from Vampire Weekend. We were going to a, we were going to a, a Tool concert, like, together, which by the way, I can't wait to do, I can't wait to go. So, but we went to the Tool concert <laughs> and um, Tool came out, but they were like in costume as an 80s hair band. <laughs> and in the dream, they thought it was really funny that they would kind of come out as an 80s hair band, even though they're Tool. And um, nobody thought it was funny, it was horrible. Like everyone's really mad. Don't be an 80s hair band. It goes on, it gets weirder from there, but I'm just gonna stop right there. 
But that wasn't what I was thinking about. <laughs> I was thinking about my first music teacher when I would, some reason I was sitting here on this chair playing music for you guys and I thought, oh my God, I just remembered being 10 years old, I took drum lessons and I had this, my first music teacher was a, was a, a drum teacher, named, his name was Hi Frank, H-Y-F-R-A-N-K. And he was, <laughs> and he was um, a 90 year old guy. He was like five foot one and he played Dixieland drums. He was in a group called High Frank and his ambassadors of Dixieland. <laughs> and he used to come to my house. This is a completely true story. Completely true story. He would walk into the kitchen, tell my dad to make him a drink, make him a cocktail, and then proceed to start telling my dad and my mom, I guess, was there too, I'm sure. Don't let this kid grow up to be a musician. <laughs> That's like, that was the drum lesson. The drum lesson was, if you love this kid, don't let him go on the road and drive around the country. And he was right. <laughs> okay. I don't know why about that. Let me sing a song now. Thank you. I think he was a little more detailed about how bad it is out there. It's crazy. All right. So I th maybe I thought of that because I was about to play this song. Let me see if I can do this. It's been a while. Okay, now I know why I thought that. I'm just going to start the song and I'm not going to just talk the whole night away. I'm playing music. <laughs> but he used to say to my parents, there's all kinds of crazy women out there and <laughs> crazy, crazy characters, you know, that are, he's gonna run into and he's gonna get into trouble. And... So this song I wrote a while ago. Anyway, somehow that connects. Guys, I wrote that song when my daughter was very young, probably six days old or something like that. And that was kind of a, a uh, combination lullaby song and, and dad, you know, like, oh my God. <laughs> um, there's a couple other ones. Um, let me do this. Uh, oh boy, that would be, I don't know that one. I'm sorry, but that was the, that was who she was. Uh, that was Eliza that that was written about that, um, that song. Or that was her nickname was Billy at the time. Um, Can I do this one real quick? Which was, um, I love playing wingsuit, man. I'll, I'll do that anytime you want. Uh, um, this one was written shortly before she was born. So these two songs are strangely connected, Billy Breeze. And Billy Breeze was right after she was born. But this was written um, um, in the confusing six days before becoming a father, like right before becoming a father. So. Um, it's got a little of that in there. I get, um, I've gone to, you know, it's kind of embarrassing coming to someone's town and playing this song for people who are probably so, but I love that song and I love that album and I've looked at that album cover and thought, wow, that must be what Eau Claire looks like, you know, that beautiful, and lo and behold, it's beautiful. So, thanks for uh, putting up with that. I'll tell you a funny story that we were in New Orleans once with Tab and we were, um, thank you, and we were in, we were at, at Tipitina's or someplace, like some, and I was like, I was going to do a Professor Longhair song in honor of Professor Longhair. There's this guy who was like sweeping up, this old New Orleans guy was like, we were in soundcheck, there's one guy who's like sweeping up the floor. We did, you know, some Professor Longhair song. And I kind of looked at him and I was like, what do you think, man? And he was like... <laughs> No. So we didn't end up doing it. But this is a guy who used to see Professor Longhair. So. I'm assuming you guys have seen Bonnie Bear before. Anyway, sorry. Forgive me. Coming from a place of love. Now let me now test your singing skills here. You guys in much of a rush.
Thank you for having me, man. I... I'm really genuinely and sincerely excited to come to this town for quite some time. I've never been here before. Um, my... Okay, the, 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 the girl, that the, my daughter that, the, that Billy Breeze was written about and also, you know, that Strange Design, when, when she was young, her first, her first love, okay, was this, and when they were like three years old, like a first, you know, her little kind of boy pal. It's this kid named Michael, Michael Hagen, right? I think we have some friends in the audience. You know where I'm going with this? Because I have family members in the audience. And, so there, we, and Michael, when he was, I don't know, six or something, came to me one day and asked me for permission to marry my daughter, Eliza. <laughs> Asked Dad. I said, sure, Michael, you can, you can marry. So he was going to be, you know, my, you know, he was going to marry Eliza and be part of the family. Now, his great-grandfather, okay, is a guy named, um, um, what's his last name? Goldenberg. Um, Charles Buckets Goldenberg. You ever heard of this guy? <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. He was a uh, fullback for Wisconsin, right? And then, uh, and then he was a uh, pulling guard for the Packers from 1933 to 1945. <laughs> Buckets Goldenberg is Michael's. So Sue, my wife Sue's best friend, Wendy's grandfather, is this guy Buckets Goldenberg. Okay. And uh, pulling guard for the Packers from 1933 to 1945, he won three championships <laughs> under Curly Lambeau, his coach. That would have been my uh, grandfather. So that's how connected I am to this area. Oh, family, man, come on. Give it to me. Give it to me, all right? <laughs> Unfortunately, Michael married somebody else about a month ago, so he's, I'm not. That was all. Watch it. That was all for nothing. Haley's. I could try it, man. You've been yelling this all night. I'm going to do this for this guy. I, I don't even know if I can. Let me see this. Some of these songs. Give me a second. Oh, man. Uh, next time. Next time. All right? <laughs> Sorry, dude. Sorry. Sorry. I hate letting you down. All right, let me do a... No, let me do this. Let me do this. What the, f what the hell? Let me try this. Thanks for having me, man. Having me back. I've been here before. Who's in the house tonight? Who's in the house? Cleveland in the house? Cleveland in the house? I've never done the in the house thing before. That's just a new. Akron in the house? Akron? 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 Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh in the house? Oh man, sorry. Uh oh. We're gonna get into some gang warfare that I don't know anything about here. Sorry. Morgantown? Morgantown in the house? Nothing? Young son? Young son? <laughs> All right, man. Enough of that. Anybody that was at Blossom in the house? <laughs> now we're talking. Now we're talking. Fish Nation. Come on, man. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm not going to do that yet. I want to do this. Let me do this. Take him down. Take him down. Enough of this guy in warfare. He's like naked and afraid. Are you guys fans of that? I love that show. I was watching it on the bus. So good. 
Okay, what am I doing here? I, got... I think they should do one in suburbia on a golf course. <laughs> I think it'd be unbelievable. You know? <laughs> and that's that. You know, one time, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but one, one time I was playing at Blossom, and I went up to the microphone and made this wish to the universe that one of my favorite bands would get back together. Now, and it came true. It was that easy. It was that easy. Now, for the record, since they're both friends of mine, I had nothing to do with that at all. I'm not claiming to, but, so, Aaron, Mickey, I know you guys are rolling your eyes right now. Even though I actually did have a lot to do with it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I didn't. But um, I figured, since this is the lucky part of the country here, that that, that comes true, I'm gonna say, for the record, oh God, it's just the, this crazy internet. Everything you say goes on the fucking internet. No. But um, I would like, please, for Christmas, I would like the original four-piece talking heads to please get back together, at least for one show. Two times this is gonna work. <laughs> so, I was lucky enough to see that band. That's how old I am. And, uh, incredible. One of my favorite bands of all time. And, I I'm not gonna play some little <laughs> I'm going to play a regular old song about little old me. Anyway, I've said it, so here we go, universe. Oh, okay. Um, hang on, let me do this here. I keep picking up the wrong song. Thanks, you guys. You guys think that's going to work? Yeah. I don't think it's going to work. You gotta believe, right? Well, that was really weird that like, the time space continuum there. I was like playing that song. <laughs> it's so weird. It's the older I get, these strange things start happening. Is anybody else getting just more confused by every day? Because I am. I can't figure out what the hell's going on anymore. I mean, like, about anything. I used to think I, I used to have confidence or something when I was young, like I, like I got it. Oh, I know what's going on here. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, <laughs> you know, just getting breakfast is so confusing. But I was... <laughs> I was uh, playing that song, and then as I was playing it, because it was fat, like I was playing really fast, right? You, you might have noticed. That was an incredibly fast song. And then I remembered playing how fast we used to play, like hyper-caffeinated we were, like as a young band. And then I remembered playing, and I think it was like 1999 or something, we went to Japan to the Field of Dreams. None of you were really there, come on. Are you allowed to say woo if you weren't there? That's like, is there like a rule about that? Remember that gig in Venezuela? Woo! Yeah! That was so cool. You guys weren't at the Field of Dreams. Come on. The Field of Dreams was we played at the Fuji Rock Fest, okay, in Japan. It's a beautiful festival. And, um, and incredible bands. I think it was 1999. And, um, Fish went over there, and they, the Japanese fans set up, we had our own area at the festival. They, were, they, they, had, been, they had been watching the, um, the, the fish festivals 
from Japan, like, you know, Great Went and Lemon Wheel and all that stuff, and they wanted to kind of do their own, like, mini fish festival over there, as, as, the, as the, you know, only the Japanese people could do. They recreated the whole thing, and we got there, and there's like a miniature, it's called Field of Dreams, a mini fish festival on the side of the actual Fuji Fest, right? <laughs> Which is like the story of our life. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Example, I just walked by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yesterday. <laughs> And there we are in the lobby. <laughs> Which is kind of cool. Like, like, like we're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but we're in the lobby, we're the hot dog. So we weren't really, we weren't really at the Fuji Rock Fest. We were sort of next to it because the bands that were playing, were, it was amazing bands that year. So one of the bands was Rage Against the Machine at the peak of their, like, at the peak of their powers. Like at the, like at the cutting edge of right when they were just, oh my God. We stopped our set, we went over, we, we stood on the side of the stage, we watched Rage Against the Machine. It's like, you know, 60,000 people like moshing and sink. Oh, so good. And then, and then ZZ Top was there, like great bands. And the reason that what I was thinking about when I was playing Chakta's Torture is that backstage, behind the main stage, we would go over from our ridiculous little stage over on the side and kind of like hang out with the real bands, right? And, um, and they had this, this, <laughs> this whiteboard. I don't even know if I can be able to explain this story, but I'm gonna try. So it was the place for all of the crew members who had gone, you know, many, many hours on overnight flights to get to Japan and stuff like that to vent their frustrations, right? So it was basically like a, people would write things about the festival <laughs> that, you know, they hated. Like it would be ostensibly like the food or whatever. And um, so all these bands and all of these crew members had like filled this whiteboard with like rags on fish. <laughs> There's like something smells fishy here and you know, stupid things like that. Like it was just, it was just packed with like ragging on, like all the other bands ragging on fish. So here's the part that I was thinking about while I was playing. So we're laughing, we walk by, we're like, oh my God, what the hell? You know, <laughs> like we're like the bane of the, and, and, and somehow we got fish, John Fishman had the dress on because we had run over from our, <laughs> from our field of dreams. And we got him this cowboy hat. So he was like wearing this big white, like ridiculous, like clownishly ridiculous cowboy hat and, and, and his dress. And like, you know, like these rotten sneakers that were like 100 years old. And we were all laughing about this. We set this thing up where they said we stood him next to this board, right? And as the bands would walk by, like, you know, Billy Gibbons or something, he was like going, he's like going, Hey, hi. He's like, he's like, I'm fish from fish. He's like, and then he's like, he's like, I'm, I'm fish from fish. He's like shaking over his head. He's like, you might have seen me on the board. And then he's like, and then he goes, he's like, well, wait, like, wait just a doggone minute. What? That's the suck board. What? Like, anyway. This is one of the great memories in my life. <laughs> the three of us standing there watching fish. Like I said, I don't even know if I can do it justice, but you really gotta use your imagination and picture him. Oh, wait, wait just a goddamn minute. Oh, that's the suck board. <laughs> I'm fish, I'm fish. Oh my God, what a life. Thank you. Okay, where, where are we here? <laughs> That's a harder story to tell than some of the... Because you, you really got to... All right, man. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for being here with me. Thank you, really. I do a couple more here in... I love coming here and we do we've been here many times in this part of the country and I hope many more to come um, I
Let's do this. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can. That's a tough one. Listen, I've heard you've been saying that tonight, and, and I, I love you. <laughs> but I don't know that I could pull that one off without those other three little guys. There. People like yell out stuff. They're like, Reba. I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> let, me just, let me just do this here. Thank you guys, the thank you. Oh man, let me, let me do this. So speaking of my, my good friend, um, I, I think I could probably do that. All right, let me try it, let me try it. Hey man, I'm gonna, well, do something that I don't do right, right away, right off the bat, that I don't know about do this very often. But I'm gonna send this out um, to a guy named Scott Marks, who may or may not be here, some of you may know him. But um, um, I played here in like, well, a lot of times actually, but I'll get to that later. But I did play my uh, first ever solo acoustic show here in 1999. Yes, you're correct there. I played this song, and I, I don't think I played it again for years and years and years, and I, uh, this, um, Scott Marks was very kind to reach out a couple times and say, hey man, you should play this tune. I was kind of like, really? Is that, is that a good song? And anyway, so Scott, wherever you are, I want to thank you for that, because um, I do love this song, and it was kind of because of him that it came back. But it was debuted on this stage in 1999. Thank you. Man, I gotta tell you, it's incredibly cool being back here. It's really, really, you know, I'm flooded with memories coming in here. We used to come so frequently to this town and also to this venue. Um, uh, I think we, in 1991, we, used, we played, it. our first gig here was at a place called Rick's Cafe. <laughs> Is that still here? <laughs> that actually wasn't our gig. Wait, was it our gig? Did I play there? I think I did play there. But all I remember is that before the, okay, that's right. We, we played there and we had a warm-up band and I sat in with them. So um, I looked it up. Um, so the, the band that I, my first gig ever here was in a, with a band called Rhythmic Feud. Anybody? Anyway, if those guys are out there somewhere, I want to thank them for inviting me on stage. That was my first, uh, my first ever gig. And then we played here lots of times in the early 90s. Um, this tune is also, it's so much history in this room. Uh, this was also debuted in this room the same night as the other tune, so I'm gonna play this one for you. That's a creative ending. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody was probably here in, in 1993 when we played here. Is anybody here? The, the, were you really? The, people always say woo like that, but were you actually here? Yeah. So, of course, it goes without saying that you remember the greatest big black furry creature from Mars of all time. I don't even know how to tell that story. We, we played big black furry creature from Mars, and for the, we played two nights here in like 1992, 1993. And, um, fish and um, we ended this first night with it was a crazy night and we ended it with big like Frank creature from Mars and I, don't, I can't remember exactly how this happened but somehow we were just going crazy and I think Mike had the one mic stand was up high and my mic stand was down low and we were running around the stage like crazy and 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 um, and um, uh, I was like sort of like lying on my back the way I, 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 you were there, I don't, I don't remember this, but, and um, there was this one part in the song where you're like, I'm supposed to count the song back in, like one, two, three, four, and they're like, you know. 
And there's a different part where Fish counts the saga, like one, two, three, four. And we couldn't remember whose turn it was to count it back. <laughs> or something like that. And I just remember lying on the ground for a really long time. I mean, just in silence. But the crowd screaming and yelling, and then it's like, it kind of like went way beyond being funny anymore. Like, I mean, a long time, like seemingly, like Mike said afterwards that he was sitting there thinking that we were gonna get, you know, charged by the union for going over curfew. We're just lying there. Everybody's like, what the, what the hell's going on? And like, oh, oh. And anyway, the next night we came back and Oh, one other thing. We went to this party that night. I was, I, listen, we got a lot of history in this town, so it's all coming back to me. Wait a minute. What the hell is it? Oh, yeah. Is there still a band called Uncle Chunk playing around? You guys remember them? Okay. Deep Space Six, you remember them? All right. We went to a party with those guys after the first night. And I think Fish and, Fish and Mike got up and they were all jamming together. It was like Uncle Chunk, Deep Space Six, and Fish and Mike, and every, we were all just hanging out. And, and I think they were playing a very long version of the Sanford and Son theme or something. <laughs> or something. Anyway, the next day, and then we started hearing from people like how obnoxious this thing we had done was because we were at the party. So the next night we came back here and we started inviting people up on stage to reflect into the microphone on their experiences from the night before. <laughs> and it was like, oh man, that was horrible. And, wow, that was really cool. That was... And um... anyway, that's it. I, there's, there's... <laughs> this is the shit that you think about when you come back after all these years. All right, I'm playing music. I also think I made a joke about, this was like days after last thing. I made some joke about it got a good reaction. Do you guys remember that that game when <laughs> your home team here and uh, the guy called timeout with 10 seconds left? Because <laughs> that's the end of the story. Is I think after everyone shared their experiences, somebody handed me the mic and they said because it was my fault the whole thing. And they said, "How did you feel?" I said, "I felt terrible. I felt like I called timeout with 10 seconds left in the room." Yeah. And it got, it got a very loud reaction from the crowd, like, oh! So anyway, let's turn that all around and go forward. I know, I know you guys are playing uh, Nostradamus tomorrow. <laughs> Who would have predicted that? Okay, sorry. I'm going on now. For it. I'm going for it. Oh, Notre Dame. No, not Notre Dame. That's Notre Dame. No, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. All right, here we go. I'll come back to Deer Creek anytime. Thank you. And by the way, It's Deer Creek to me, not whatever the fuck it's called now. This is just as, this is, that Deer Creek's one of my favorite places to play. I think we played there like 25. Not uh, being, you know, speaking, Deeply, deeply from my heart. Not any more excited that, about that than playing here again, because um, this is the first place we ever played in Indianapolis, it was on this stage. First fish gig ever, it was right here. And that was in uh, 1993. Some of you kids probably weren't even born then. <laughs> Pretty crazy back then in the 90s. Pretty wacky. Pretty wacky. So this is 
really a big deal for me. I was so excited when I came in. <laughs> you fucked me there, Michael. You fucked me. That's my dear friend, Michael, over there, my guitar tech. <laughs> well, that was interesting what I was thinking about while I was playing that, because that was not the right tuning, and that's a complex song. So, right when I started, I was like, this is in the wrong tuning. And I was like, and I started thinking about. Ah, there we go. It's funny because I literally was thinking this. So I'll tell you a quick story about this, this area, this room. In, um, so we played here in 93. It was our first show here ever. Um, was anybody actually at that? Such a fun time, man. I don't even know what to say. It's funny, because that two-year period, like 93, 94, I got married in 1994, and we did like, I mean, we were on the road. We did three loops around the country. We used to come to this area a lot. Um, 94, yeah, 95, I think, too. And I thought that there was, um, I think 94, we played, we played here, right? 94, yeah. And um, for a while during that tour, we brought, um, we brought um, the Reverend Jeffrey Mosier on, the t on tour with us. So he was, this all has something to do, I thought about it because I was playing out of tune. Um, he was in the original Colonel Bruce um, and the Aquarium Rescue Unit band. So we met those guys in like 1991. For those of you who don't know, Colonel Bruce used to have a, a, a um, he, you know, great guy, dear friend. We did many, many tours with him and he would put together these bands of astounding musicians, all of whom in Bruce's opinion were, were too good, you know, and needed to be what he called broken. And what he would do is like untune their guitars and stuff and tell them to stop playing so good. <laughs> so one of them was this guy, Reverend Jeffrey Mosier, who we took on the road for a few weeks when we were in this part of the country and um, I, it was either here, like Bloomington or something, we played here. It's Bloomington, okay. And um, we brought him on the road with us because we wanted, he's a, he was a bluegrass master and he, we wanted him to teach the four of us, you know, traditional bluegrass. Um, so every day on the bus, we would have like uh, a violin, an upright bass, a banjo. I think Mike was playing banjo, I was playing fiddle. And um, he would teach us these old time bluegrass songs. And um, I remember in Bloomington, we had a big party after the gig out in the parking lot. And we were playing all these tunes. Anyway, um, um, that was, so that band, that original Colonel Bruce and the Aquarium Rescue Unit band was O'Teal was, was the bass player. And um, Jimmy Herring was the, um, was the guitar player. And, um, Colonel Bruce and Reverend Mosier and, and Jeff Sipe was the drummer of that band. And, you know, we used to play in front of like five people, you know, in these bars and just, so, you know, that was one of Bruce's things was if your guitar is out of tune, just play it better, you know, stop being so damn good all the time. It's, like, it's overrated. Or I don't know, I like the way that song sounds when it is in tune, though. <laughs> You'll have to wait till the next show. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. Thank you so much. Oh, man, it's just so many, so many memories. It's weird. It's getting weird. No, seriously. Seriously. It's getting weirder. Getting weirder for you? Anybody else? Weirder?
I mean, just driving down there, coming into town today, like looking out the window, it's raining, it's like, you know, I've seen this road before, you know, like, I'll, it's crazy, man. Like, we played it to Tur Greek like 25 times, I think. I guess. And then, you know, the Murat, you know, the 90s, the Murat and the whole thing, and like coming back into town, it's just like, wow. But of course, today we have woke culture, right? Is that what we have? Whatever the fuck that is. I prefer woke culture. To... Sorry. Sorry. That's my kind of culture right there. I understand it, you know what I mean? I don't know the rules to woke, to woke culture. I used to wash dishes at this place called Sid's Deli for a couple of years. I don't know why I'm thinking about this. It might have been because of what I had for lunch. But it was, it was this job I had just washing dishes and this guy used to work with Walter. He's a good guy. He used to like, I would wash the dishes. He was like cooking, you know, and like every once in a while, he'd like, he'd like, he'd, like, he'd go, psst, hey, brother, hey, psst. And I'd turn around. And, He'd like take a steak, like a little piece, he'd like throw it to me, you know, my soapy covered hands. And like, <laughs> like looking out the window, like to see that Sid wouldn't come back and see that we were, you know, like eating the steak, you know. And, <laughs> and <laughs> he used to like, this is all true. He would, if I, you, you could do that back then when you were 16, 17 years old. If I would bring him like a 40 ounce bud, he would bring me like a nickel bag. <laughs> Which was like, it was like a little tiny plastic bag with seeds in it and stuff. <laughs> I'd bring him like a 40 ouncer at work, right? It's just the two of us back there for like two years washing dishes and cooking, me and Walter. Anyway, this is, this is gonna ruin your, this, this story is gonna destroy your love of a certain food. But anyway, so this is a Jewish deli and they, they ate a lot of coleslaw at this jelly, at this deli. A lot, coleslaw, coleslaw, coleslaw. So they had to make the coleslaw in this like um, huge, like one of those, it was like a silver curved, you know, it was like this big. And they, Walter would like <laughs> take these like giant, like five gallon jars of mayonnaise and you know, like, <laughs> like, <in> the, <laughs> like heads of cabbage, like <laughs> all this, you know, whatever is it called cabbage and mayonnaise and, and he always used to wear this wife beater and it was really hot back there like we sweat we were sweating it was like it was it was so anyway so that I'm not making this up after all like 10 15 gallons of mayonnaise and like he would then stir the coleslaw by going like this like he would stick his arm like all the way up to his armpit. Just, <laughs> drinking his 40 ounce here and stirring the coleslaw. <laughs> so, uh, the next time you have coleslaw, think of Walter. know what that was about. But. <laughs> I had this major crush on this waitress. I was like 16, she was like 28. I said, follow her around all the time, like getting like, you're allowed to have, you know, free soda, like, 
walk around like, hi. I'm gonna be a rock star. No. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't have believed it. She wouldn't have believed it. All right. So stupid. All right, here we go. What culture? Come on, man. That's what's gonna. That's what's gonna save us. That's the solution. Everybody's been looking for a solution for the last ten years. What culture? I need a bumper sticker now. <laughs> okay. Wow. This is really cool. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here and honored. Let me get to that one. Let me do this first. I'm not going anywhere. We got all. I gotta sing. I have to welcome the um, feminine spirit into this beautiful spiritual place. First. From uh, this is a long way from Arnold's Flamingo Grill. You guys know that? That was our first gig. That was Fish's first gig in the general vicinity. Was Arnold's Flamingo Grill, which actually is in Knoxville. You're right. Thank you. Whoever just you know that? That's amazing. Amazing. You must be old. Arnold's Flamingo Grill. I've played a few gigs at this venue, but this is the one that I'm the most excited about because... Um, it feels like, even when I got here for sound check, just this room combined with uh, an acoustic guitar, um, something about, it's like the, the vibrational frequency of this room and one acoustic guitar seems to be uh, the magic um, the magic vibration at least for me that's, that song must have been written in the um, sometime in the early to mid 90s and I kind of forgot about it for a long time and, and a, a guy a, a kind of friend of the community reminded me um, so I'm grateful to him and um, um, but it kind of makes me a little bit misty because my first daughter was born in 1995. Um, uh, you guys are laughing. She's 24 now. Yes. Doing great. Working out. And uh, working out. No. Yes. <laughs> Probably. That too. <laughs> Pumping. Getting ripped. Um, <laughs> But I mean, we were on the road so much back then, you know, and the months go by. Let me do this one. Um, ah, where does this go? But uh, I slide it around until I get some. This will explain it all. Um, let me put it here. I'm cranking it up. We're getting crazy. That's what I'm talking about, about the um, puzzle piece fitting into the cosmic puzzle piece. So this guitar is built in 1933. So who knows, man? Like, it's probably been on this stage because I bought this guitar right here in Nashville. Um, and I got it at Groon's, you know? And I had the coolest little pilgrimage there. Uh, this is like probably four or five years ago I went there and I was playing all these guitars and, and trying stuff out. And then Groon, the, the owner of the, 
It's kind of like going to that place. It's kind of like going to Ollivander's wand shop in <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> I really, I really didn't think that. Because he came down and he was like, you're playing the wrong guitar. I had all these guitars pulled out. He's like, that's not your, he listened to me play for a minute. And he's like, that's not your guitar. He brought me upstairs. I'm not kidding. And he brought me upstairs and he was going through all these gels and he like slid this one out and he kind of, here. Yeah. And I held up my hand and it drifted across. <laughs> and these like dementors that had been following me around my whole life, but ah, vanished. Oh my God, the guitar. Anyway. Uh, I, I love this guitar so much. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got this guitar. And then my other Nashville buddy, Vance Powell, who was an um, engineer. He, I think Vance might be here tonight. Vance, you here? Hey, right, cool, man. <laughs> hey, Vance, how you doing? <laughs> Vance uh, worked with me on the Ghost of the Forest album. Kicked ass, but he uh, told me this thing that I love so much, which is he said that the guitar needs to be old enough to know that it's no longer a tree. You know, it takes a few years for it to kind of accept its fate. Okay, I'm a guitar now. Now I'm gonna play music. So uh, that's kind of like this room. They're both old together. Man. This is a... <laughs> funny, it's just a funny thing. I was like, think about all these times that we spent in this town and everybody's kind of like, met so many musicians, you know, and then like when you walk in here to the backstage area at least, there's all these photos on the wall. It's pretty intimidating when you walk in. It's like, you walk in, it's like, oh, there's Bill Monroe, like on stage and, you know, Hank Williams and like, it's really heavy, like it's heavy. But the funny thing is about it is they're all kind of like badasses. They're, so there's this picture in my, in my dressing room of Hank Williams, like kicking this guy's ass. No kidding. It's right above that. He's like, grabbing this guy by the throat, like, oh, the guy, oh. <laughs> they're all kind of a bunch of, you know, shit kickers. <laughs> so I'm like, and then I remember we did this gig at, um, was anybody at this gig? It was, at, I think, Lakewood, Lakewood Amphitheater. We had all those incredible, all those musicians came down. Like, just a, it was just a plethora of, of amazing musicians. Ricky Skaggs was there. Yes. Yes, and Sam Bush and like all these, Del McCroy, everybody was all at this gig. First of all, story number one, they all came in the band room. I'm not fucking making this up. And, and they're like, I had their instruments and stuff. Ricky Skaggs. And, and they're like, oh, you know, you know. Uh, so these guys all come in the, uh, in the band room. It's like, yeah. Um, you guys want to play some tunes? And I was like, sure. And I said, you guys want to do Country Boy? You know that song, Country Boy? And so it was Ricky Skaggs. And he, he like counted it off. He's like, okay, one, two, three, four. I, I may look like a bank teller. Oh man, in the band room, two inches from our head. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And I think we did it later on the stage, but it was, I'm telling you, it was better in the band room, sorry. <laughs> But they're like, you know, drinking and talking, I don't know. And, and then I think Winona Judd was there. And we ended up doing Freebird, do you remember that? <laughs> and she like grabbed this like half naked frat boy out of the front, out of the front row and like pulled him up on stage and singing Freebird to him, if I leave here. You know? It's so funny. And then there's like, Last story, I'll keep going, but... So... This is what... This is the 
<laughs> this is a good one. So there, this is the lessons that we learned from our elders. Um, so there's a picture of Willie backstage on the wall, right? He's like been here a million times. And I remembered like we played at Farm Aid, right? So this is like 1999 or something. So this is the lesson that I learned from, <laughs> the music lesson that I learned from <laughs> Willie and Neil Young that day. So we're playing at Farm Aid, right? It's exactly how this, and Willie first invited, you know, invited me on his bus. <laughs> so this is how this whole thing started. So you go on Willie's bus, right? And he's just, just. <laughs> so the big, it begins like I'm just completely like just obliterated with, with, <laughs> with Willie on his bus, which is cool enough. So then he's kind of like, we're going to play a song or something? I said, like, yeah, man. I said, how about, um, you know, Moonlight in Vermont? Because we're from Vermont. And he says, okay, we're gonna do Moonlight in Vermont, like a farm aid. And he's like, you guys do your little thing. I'll stand on the side stage, I'll come out. So then I like, you know, I'm crippled. And I'm like, try to get off the bus. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I'm trying to find the door and... Like, okay, Moonlight in Vermont, I gotta learn, I gotta learn this song, learn the chords. And, and then, right next to his bus, is Neil Young's bus. So I'm like, I go on Neil Young's bus, right? Some of the other guys were probably with me, but... And then I go on there, and he's on there, and, and Woody Harrelson is like on the bus. And they're like, getting high on Neil's bus. So now I'm getting more crippled on, and, and then, oh my God, the whole thing was, so, and they're like talking and his bus is like built out of like old pieces of car that are like, I've seen pictures of it. It's like, wow, you know, there's like wood beams and like, you know, the hoods of cars like soldered onto the bus and like tapestries and like fringy lamps all over the place. It's really cool. Like, touching the fringe and all this. And, wow, you know, like I'm on. So then he's like, Are we, you, you wanna play a song? I'm like, yeah, let me, let's play a song, you know? And he's like, what do you wanna play? And I said, man, Powderfinger, right? And he's like, okay, man, like, okay, cool. And so like, he had like some guitars and like we sit down and we start playing Powderfinger, like on the bus. I'm dying, you know? Like, oh my God. And we, we practice it, right? And we get it, it's like, good, you're gonna take this harmony, I'm gonna do that, and, and all right, now I gotta get off that bus so I can find the door. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, but holy shit, we're gonna play, excuse my language in the church on Sunday. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think any of these guys would mind that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we're gonna play, we practiced it, it's ready, we got the two songs ready, right? All I gotta do is like keep myself together. And um, I get, I start walking off the, off the bus, and just as I'm walking off, Neil's like, you know, he says, uh, he says, I, I don't like to, I'm not that good at planning stuff. So whatever that means. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, cool. Cause like, I'm not really either. <laughs> so then so I walk off and he's going to do his solo acoustic set right before ours. So it's like, I walk on the bus, he's going to walk on and and then we're gonna go on and do this powder finger. So he walks out with his acoustic guitar and he's like, look out, mama. It's like, he starts playing powder finger. <laughs> like in his set. <laughs> I'm kinda like, well, hey, you know, <laughs> okay, whatever. He's not coming on, that's my message, forget the whole thing, right? <laughs> so then, <laughs> We go on, I just forgot. I was like, after practicing and rehearsing, I learned I had the you know, words like taped up or something. Anyway, we go on, we just start playing and we're playing and we get into this jam, like at Farm Aid, and, and we just kind of veer off into some like la la jam, right? And we're like, yeah, wow, well, yeah. I'm like looking over to fish and like, yeah, oh, jam, jam, jam. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, I hear, I just kind of lost track of where I was and I gave up on the Neil Young thing because he played the song, so we're not gonna do that. And then, like, I hear this sound behind me, and it's my guitar, right? I know how that sounds. 
And it's like, uh, like I'm playing, and I hear this like, I'm like trying to figure out where it's coming from and all this shit. <laughs> and then like I turn around and it turns out that Neil had like heard this jam and he was kind of really into it. He's like, wow, that's a cool jam. He just walked out on stage <laughs> behind me and picked up my spare guitar and like plugged it into the amp. I didn't have any guitars out there or anything. Just started rocking out. Like, on whatever we were doing. And I think we went into some other song. We just made something up. Oh yeah, oh, like, Down by the River or something. Cause there. And then apparently, cause like the crew, the final part of the story is that everybody's standing over the side and I guess Willie was standing over on the side and he was kind of starting to get mad cause this was going on for a long time. <laughs> We were supposed to stop. This is like a TV show, you know? Everybody's like, God, and, and he was gonna come out and do. Anyway, so what did I learn from all that? Um, never plan anything. <laughs> and I will take that one to the grave. Thank you. I don't know what. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be home. No, really, I mean that. I've been, I've been doing this show all over the country. I've never done it in New York before, so. Never done that. I'm ex very excited about this. So thank you for being here with me. I feel like the Hobbit coming back from a great adventure. So many things to tell all of you about Cleveland and Minneapolis and all these crazy places I saw. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, you guys can check that off your list now, your life list. You all sang at Carnegie Hall. That's pretty, pretty damn impressive. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all of you. How did you get here? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> You take the C? No, you take the, the B? Hey, the B, right? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> you can, and you can tell I'm a professional musician because my guitar was out of tune. Bet you didn't even know. Somebody probably noticed that. I was deeply out of tune. But you were perfect. All of you. You weren't out of tune at all. So now I'm putting this back in tune. Um, it's really, thank you. It's really, uh, it's so exciting to be here. I have been here a couple of times before, but never in this sitting just with the acoustic guitar. Last time I, I brought a little backing combo with me. <laughs> the New York Philharmonic. <laughs> ah, who needs those guys? <laughs> That's my backing combo. Um, which, okay, there we go. Does that sound okay? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to tell because I just thought when I said that I learned so much from playing that show. I did get to play with the Philharm Philharmonic here and um, really incredible experience if I could just take one brief moment to share this with you. So one of the things I learned um, was, I don't know if you guys know exactly how orchestras work, but there's a conductor right up there and they're all watching the conductor. But in reality, um, do you guys know what the concert master is? Have you heard of the, the concert master? The, co the concert master is the first violinist, the person everybody claps when they walk on, it's the last, and they tune up the orchestra. Well, the concert master for that concert was, um, her name was Cheryl Staples, and um, incredibly talented woman. And I stood here and she's sat right there. And what they do is that they, um, they, when the orchestra starts to drift, especially in like complex passages, you would think that they would all look to the um, conductor, but what actually happens is the concert master is sort of the most confident musician on stage, and they'll start, like they'll make a statement, a musical statement, 
and then the whole orchestra will snap into place. It's an incredible thing to, to, um, to experience that among, you know, 90 people, somebody could do that. Um, step up and whoosh on the, on the violin and then the whole orchestra snaps into, um, you know, to that person's, um, and I've always wanted to kind of, like this is maybe my chance to thank her because I learned, I, want, I do want to thank her publicly. And then I'm going to go on and just keep playing songs. But she taught me a lesson that I've brought so frequently to, fi to fish um, in jams and stuff like that. And I think about her frequently um, that, you know, there's times like when if things start to kind of drift off, you've got to step up like and say something. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> And then everybody kind of jumps on it. Anyway, so thank you, Cheryl, for keeping fish jams from going completely off the rails. Anyway, let me keep going. How's it going? A bunch of those last songs were written with my lifelong friend, Tom Marshall. I'm thinking, I think Tom is here tonight, so I'm just going to assume he is. Hi, Tom. I still play. I don't know if I can explain how funny this was, but the, um, one of my favorite memories with Tom, through all these years, we've been friends since, I don't know, like fourth grade or something, and um, many years and so many funny memories. But this one time we were playing somewhere around here in the Northeast, and you know Stephen Wright, the comedian Stephen Wright? You guys familiar? <laughs> funny guy. One of the funniest humans on earth. He shows up at the gig, right? <laughs> and um, he comes in our band room. We were all very excited because we were all big Stephen Wright fans. You know, understated, droll, quiet Stephen Wright. And there was a little bathroom, it's like a small band room, and there's a bathroom right next to the band room. And um, the door's open, and it's just a little bathroom, and there's like two little stalls in the bathroom. So Stephen Wright goes in <laughs> to use the bathroom, and then I see out of the corner of my eye, Tom goes in after Stephen Wright, and they're standing next to each other, like there's like a divider, and um, they're going to the bathroom, and uh, <laughs> standing up. and. Um, <laughs> Suddenly I hear, out of the thing, I hear Stephen, Stephen Wright starts whistling, right? And he's going. <laughs> right? Piano man, right? And um, <laughs> so Tom, I hear Tom through the door. He says, is that Billy Joel? <laughs> and, <laughs> and meaning like, are you whistling Billy Joel? And, um, and Stephen Wright says, I'm not sure, right? <laughs> and, then, and then there's like a long pause, and Tom says, no, I meant you. Are you Billy Joel? <laughs> and he goes, Stephen Wright says, that's what I meant. <laughs> and I'm still laughing. I'm still laughing about that. There's a lot of things I'm grateful to Tom for, but that more than anything. So, um, I looked it up and uh, this building, opening, opening night in this, in this magical space was May 5th, 1891. This is some food for thought. Um, on that date, there was, <laughs> 1.6 billion people on Earth. Today there's 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth. And I looked it up. If I played a show when I was 80, which I hope there will be, maybe here. There will be 10 billion people on Earth. Think about that for a minute. That's a lot more people than when they open the doors to this building. <laughs> Not to get depressing or anything. Anyway, um, 
1891, um, they opened their doors. In uh, 1910, my grandfather, uh, who was uh, born in Amalfi, Italy, immigrant, came, and who I'm named after. Uh, my father, my grandfather, and I all share the same name. That's where the tray comes from. I'm the third. An amazing guy who I love very dearly. My grandfather taught me, played me a lot of music when I was growing up and was a big fan of classical music. Saw concerts here and many concerts um, at Sprague Hall in New Haven. He had season tickets to the symphony there. He was a... Um, lover of serious um, kind of heavier stuff. He used to always kind of, in a loving way, make fun of my grandmother because she liked Mozart and he liked Rachmaninoff. He was like, oh, she likes that light stuff. <laughs> Mozart. <laughs> so uh, I just was thinking how cool it is when I was backstage just to be sitting here and how excited he would be to be here. So I'm going to dedicate this one to my grandfather. I think he would have approved. We'll see. It's such a pleasure singing these kind of songs in this this room. Um, it's just, I mean, I've never heard anything quite like it. So there's these pictures backstage when you're walking on stage. It is unbelievable as you walk down the hallway to come on stage back there. They have all these pictures of these orchestras and, and musicians going back to like the 1920, there's a picture from 1922. And these, these musicians are, it's kind of like that, the end, you know the end of The Shining when he ends up in the photo? <laughs> it's like that, it's just like that. I and mean, it's creepy walking on here because like, um, I mean, I know I've believed this my whole life and I believe it more with every passing year of playing music that the, the, the purpose of being a musician is you're, you know, you're supposed to be a channel, right? You're, you're a, I like to think of it as um, you're what I would call a temporary steward of the, of the music. You're a, you're a temporary, um, you know, guide or something like that between the listener and wherever it comes from, um, right? So what happens though, at a place like this, I mean, it's like the, it's like the physical manifestation of that concept. You, you, you walk in this room that's been around since 1891, everyone who was around when it was built, of course, is, is long gone. And then you go down the hallway and there's these like incredibly wild, picture after picture after picture of like the orchestra from 1930 and the, and you know, and I don't know, Duke Ellington and all these people who've played here, right? And, and I was thinking as I was walking, you know, Bach sat down and wrote this music and at the top of every piece of music that he ever wrote, he would write for the glory of God, right? In, in whatever language, but at, at each, <laughs> I don't know what language he was in. But, um, but he would say at the top of his, very famously, he would write, for the glory of God, and then he would write his music, his beautiful Bach music. But in his mind, he was like, I'm just channeling this, or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here to do a service. He then passed away, right? The music came out. These orchestras come up here in like the 20s, sit down. They all have the same chairs, the same tuxedos on this stage right here. Here's this beautiful room, and all of a sudden this music appears that was written, you know, all the way back then. And everybody hears it, and they kind of bask in this sound. And then every single person on the stage that are in those pictures has now passed away. They're gone. Other people come, sit in the chairs, and here comes this music again through, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like I've always thought of music that way, that as a musician, it's your, it's your, it's your moment to have. You're supposed to do this thing as long as you're around, and then you vanish and somebody else takes your place. And, uh, but when you're at a, in a place like this, it's, the concept is so abundantly clear. You know, the same walls, the same seats. There's pictures back there of the audience, and they're all gone. I mean, like, there's a front. <laughs> so you guys are... 
your history. Just, you know, enjoy the moment because you're not going to be here for very long. That's kind of what I'm getting at. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're goners. You're a bunch of goners. That's the. Uh... Temporary, temporary listener or something. <laughs> Making way. Okay, hold on for a second. Thank you. I got lost in concept there. You guys in a rush? You gotta get out of here? Hey man, let me do, let me do this. I want to do this. So, um, if you don't, if you will, hang on for a second. Let me let me do this. driver who lives inside my head starts me up and stops me and puts me into bed he opens up my mouth when it's time for me to talk and fires up my legs when he wants me to walk my eyes open for most of the day adds to my memory things that people say when he makes decisions I don't have to wait sometimes it seems that he's got too much on his plate like this morning when I woke up and he dressed me in this shirt That looks a little ragged Where he dragged me through the dirt I'm moving through this life And I'm thinking about the next And hoping when I get there I'll be better dressed Keeps my eyes open most of the day adds to my memories the things that people say when he makes decisions I don't have to wait I tell you about the driver who lives inside my head It's such a pleasure singing these kind of songs in this, this room. Um, it's just, re I mean, I've never heard anything quite like it, so. There's these pictures backstage when you're walking on stage. It is unbelievable. As you walk down the hallway to come on stage back there, they have all these pictures of these orchestras and, and musicians going back to like the 1920 there's a picture from 1922 and these these musicians are it's kind of like that the end you know at the end of the shining when he ends up in the photo it's like that it's just like that I and mean, it's creepy walking on here because like um i mean i know i've believed this my whole life and i believe it more with every passing year of playing music that the, the, the purpose of being a musician is you're, you know, you're supposed to be a channel, right? You're, you're a, I like to think of it as um, you're what I would call a temporary steward of the, of the music. You're a, you're a temporary, um, you know, guide or something like that between the listener and wherever it comes from, um, right? 
so what happens though at a place like this i mean it's like the it's like the physical manifestation of that concept you you, you walk in this room that's been around since 1891 everyone who was around when it was built of course is, is long gone and then you go down the hallway and there's these like incredibly wild picture after picture after picture of like the orchestra from 1930 and the and you know and i don't know duke ellington and all these people who've played here right and and i was thinking as i was walking you know bach sat down and wrote this music and at the top of every piece of music that he ever wrote he would write for the glory of god right in in whatever language but at, at each <laughs> i don't know what language he was in but, um, but he would say at the top of his, very famously, he would write, for the glory of God, and then he would write his music, his beautiful Bach music. But in his mind, he was like, I'm just channeling this, or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here to do a service. He then passed away, right? The music came out. These orchestras come up here in like the 20s, sit down. They all have the same chairs, the same tuxedos on this stage right here. Here's this beautiful room, and all of a sudden this music appears that was written, you know, all the way back then. And everybody hears it, and they kind of bask in this sound. And then every single person on the stage that are in those pictures has now passed away. They're gone. Other people come, sit in the chairs, and here comes this music again through. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like I've always thought of music that way, that as a musician, it's your, it's, your, it's your moment to have, you're supposed to do this thing as long as you're around and then you vanish and somebody else takes your place. And, uh, but when you're at a, in a place like this, it's, the concept is so abundantly clear. You know, the same walls, the same seats, there's pictures back there of the audience and they're all gone. I mean, like, there's a front, <laughs> so you guys are, <laughs> Your history. Just, you know, enjoy the moment because you're not going to be here for very long. That's kind of what I'm getting at. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you're goners. You're a bunch of goners. That's the... <laughs> temporary, temporary listener or something. <laughs> Making way. Okay, hold on for a second. Thank you. I got lost in concept there. You guys in a rush? You gotta get out of here. <laughs> hey man, let me do. Let me do this. Let me do this. I have to. I want to do this. So. If you don't, if you will, hang up a second. Let me, let me do this. Um. Welcome, welcome. I'm gonna do this. myself to ask that after 36 years of never saying how you guys all feeling that's the third time this tour that I've said that I always kind of found it a arbitrary thing to say not to get too logical about the whole thing but you know you can't really answer and and so really like I'm more fascinated by the fact that we're all here <laughs> um, I mean, I hope you're feeling well. I want everyone to be feeling great. I'm sure people are, some people are having a good day, some people are not having a good day. But we are all here right now. And um, having grown up in New Jersey and... Um, Jersey, come on. Married myself a nice Jersey girl. Which is, um, I used to come in, I used to come into the city when I was um, about 14 to take my first ever guitar lessons like 
two blocks from here, r literally right on that corner, um, I would take the train in, and my first ever guitar lessons it dawned on me when I was sitting back there. Um, and that would be, well, let's see, this, uh, 1978. Um, um, walking from Penn Station through Times Square up here as a 14-year-old boy. And it was like the greatest thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Nothing has equaled that. <laughs> I'm glad that they cleaned up Times Square, but it's a good thing. But through the eyes of a 14-year-old boy with a little guitar on his back, like walking through 1978 Times Square. Like, <laughs> I mean, I kind of liked it that way. <laughs> it, was, uh, pretty, it was a pretty unique place, like going to 48th Street back in the... But anyway, um, um, you know, I think about and I'll just stop talking, keep playing, but I, I will, I think about the number of concerts I've seen and, and just so much, so many memories within, you know, a mile of this beautiful building that we're in right now. And what dawns on me is that, you know, these things, I don't know if you're the same way, but live music is like the, the antidote to my perpetual discontent. <laughs> so... I carry, these, well, I carry these memories with me, and the further they get from me, I just think, you know, a gathering of people at a live music concert is such a magical thing, and, and, and um, it, you know, so I'm glad we're all here. I'll now continue to play some songs, but thank you for being here with me and being part of this memory. Okay, Peaches from Newark. Uh, that's from our little play that we wrote, a little musical. My co-writer and partner Amanda Green is here tonight. Hi, Amanda. I was singing that kind of for you. I learned a lot of things working on that play. That was in 2011 or something like that. And um, thank you. Was that a good year? That was a good, a cheer-worthy year, 2011. <laughs> we, uh, just momentarily, I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to talk all night. Um, <clears throat> I remember um, we started working on the, it's called Hands on a Hard Body. It's a musical, and we took a couple of, thank you, <laughs> took a couple of years to write it, and then we started doing workshops, and um, it was so fun. And our third writer, Doug Wright, an amazing, talented guy, we would do workshops in these little, in this little teeny white room, and there was like, the, the music was about a truck, and so we had a little white box that was masquerading as the truck. And 2011 was the year that our first choreographer, this guy named Benjamin Malipier, you know him? Um, he was the principal male dancer at the New York City Ballet for like six years, incredible ballet dancer, the full package, you know what I mean? Wow. And uh, he taught me some things about fashion that I've carried with me. I learned so much working on this play. So we, he stopped, he quit, he retired, and he came and he um, <laughs> came to rehearsals and we met him and it was me, uh, we were sitting at a little table, and it was me and Doug and Doug's husband David and then Amanda and her husband Jeff and Sue and I, we would all kind of be there, my daughter, and, and Benjamin started choreographing and he would, um, you know, <laughs> teach somebody a move and then do it. And it was like, you cry <gasps> and move his leg. And the first thing I noticed is he had the most incredible sense of fashion. So he came the first day and he had these amazing pants. And um, like I wanted, I, I coveted these pants. So uh, I went up to him, I, I was sitting next to Doug and I was like, Doug, man, look at those pants. I gotta ask Benjamin, I just met him, like what kind of pants these are. So I, I went up at the break, we had just met. And I'm like, man, you gotta tell me I you know we just met, but what kind of pants are those? Because I've got to, I've got to have them. And <laughs> he said, you know, they're like, you know, um, J brand or whatever. And I said, great, I wrote it down. <laughs> and then the next day, I came back and I was sitting next to Doug again. And here comes, here comes Benjamin, you know, principal ballet dancer from the, and he's got these jeans on, right? <laughs> and amazing jeans, like, 
like whatever the like polar opposite of mom jeans are, like they were like great jeans. I'm like watching these jeans. I went up in break. I was like, man, I don't know where you're getting your clothes, but can you tell me what kind of jeans those are? Because I have to have them. And you know, I wrote down. And then the next day, I came and I, I turned to Doug. I was like, oh my god, he did. It's another. And Doug was like, Trey, it's not the pants. <laughs> That really happened. <laughs> so I learned a few things about ballet dancers and fashion and Broadway musicals all at once. There's so much to learn in this crazy world. Who knew? <laughs> anyway. All right, man. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Pretty soon we'll be back on the old road there twerking for the people and Selling melancholy and the whole deal. John selling melancholy at the Dunkin' Donuts. I think I got time for a couple more. So. You guys, you guys just rocked Carnegie Hall. You rocked Carnegie Hall. That's pretty cool. You guys were just better at Carnegie Hall than a lot of people who have played Carnegie Hall, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's been some good music here. Not all, not all that good. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Just can't help myself, can't help myself. Okay, I'm gonna just kind of go back down here because I, if you're in a rush, I get a couple songs I wanna play here, so. I'm gonna say, thanks you guys, thanks. Let me do this here. Okay.